something, because that's what we get together with for, is to worship God, to express some of that love that he gave to us back to him, and then to express some of that love to each other. Uh, because we don't preach about this too much anymore in church today, but the, really the, the core of the New Testament is all about loving each other as brothers and sisters in Christ and sharing that love that God gave so freely to us, uh, sharing with that with somebody. And that's another reason why we get together on Sunday morning. Why we don't, you know, why don't, some people might ask me, why can't I just uh, watch it on TV at home? Uh, and it, certainly there's some great preachers that preach on TV. Uh, but the problem is, is you're missing out. You're missing out on a chance to share God's love with fellow believers, people who trust in Jesus Christ, love Jesus Christ as well. But you're also missing out on the blessing of receiving that too. Uh, we'd hope that you would. If you don't, then tell us and we'll get some people to get around you and love you because you need it. Everyone needs it. Uh, and Jesus Christ is real, and that's part of how he expresses his love for us, is bringing someone into our life, maybe sometimes not the person we'd pick, uh, but bringing someone into our life and expressing some of that love of Christ to us. So this is really a passage about love. Uh, this is really, you know, Christ has died uh, for love uh, in the previous chapter. He died for us, giving us his life, uh, giving his life for us. And here he's going to be rising again from the dead. But it's interesting, and you know, we, we saw that passage in Mark last week, uh, where Peter very clearly says, Peter writing through Mark, very clearly says it. He says, hey, Mary Magdalene was the first to see her. Uh, we saw actually in last week's passage that John and Peter were some of the first to come to the sepulcher, to the tomb, uh, upon Mary bringing them, Mary Magdalene bringing them there. And uh, they investigated what had happened, but then they went home. How many of us, boy, we, you know, I just, I just said that about, you know, come to church, looking for something from church, and then we rush off, right, as soon as church is over, uh, to get back to our lives. How many of us miss out on the treasure uh, that God has for you of sharing with somebody, some other fellow believer after church, and they said, you know, I listened to the sermon, or we, this song touched my heart, and you get a chance to take home a treasure uh, and you miss that. You know, too often as we as believers, we're just so busy, we're ready to rush off to the next event, uh, leave everything else behind, that we miss it. And I think that's exactly what I think John was trying to say. Hey, we were afraid. We were so afraid of what was the repercussions of what was happening there that, um, you know, we ran off and we went home and we locked ourselves in the house. And we're actually going to see next week when we come to verse 19 here in John chapter 20, uh, 20 uh, they, they, John's going to say it. We shut ourselves in a room together because we were scared. I mean, here's a bunch of grown men locking themselves in the closet because they're so scared. And John says, hey, we were running in terror and fear. And because we were, we missed the greatest opportunity ever. And that would be to see Christ risen from the dead. And Mary Magdalene, who stuck around, got to be the first one to see it. And we're going to talk about that. John is, is one of the only, uh, the other Gospels makes a mention of this, like I said, but John's the only one that really kind of flushes this experience out. And like I said, when you first try to put this together with the other Gospels, it doesn't make a lot of sense. But if you remember that Mary came before, she went with the women to the sepulcher. She was probably one of that group of women, maybe three, at least three, maybe more women, going to the sepulcher to uh, give, put some spices and stuff there in the grave of Jesus on the body of Jesus, actually in the sepulcher, that was their objective. And Mary somehow seemed to get out ahead of them, arrived before dark. John very clearly says it, before dark she arrived. The others didn't arrive until after sunrise, somehow got ahead of them, uh, arrived ahead of them, saw the, 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 the door of the tomb open, that it was empty, and ran off and went to go get John and Peter. She, she immediately thought of getting them and showing them what had happened leaving the other women there, who continue to poke around, as most curious women do, right? And, of course, some angels appeared to those other women, and they said, Hey, Jesus is not here. He's risen from the dead. Praise God. You're looking in the wrong place. And they went off and, and went rejoicing, and they, they had known the truth, and they were excited. And Mary, running back and forth, missed that whole declaration. And so here she comes back. The tomb is still empty. John and Peter have left. They've gone back to their home uh, to lock themselves back inside the house again. And Mary's standing outside the tomb wondering what has happened. The angels are no longer there. And so she gets an appearance of angels, and then she gets the appearance of actually Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, to her specifically. So this is a really exciting passage of Christ expressing his love for Mary here. And I want to start this off. In Sunday school class, you, you kind of missed it. I hoped you were there, but because uh, we had a really good 
uh, treatment on what is love. Well, we're supposed to love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, so we went in some definition on what love is. You know, in, in English, we have one word for love. Maybe we have, I like somebody, that's another type of affection. But in Greek, there are actually three different terms for love. One is eros, which is like a sexual attraction. And that's, you know, a man and a wife, we have that together, we share that. And uh, you could do that outside of marriage, and of course God forbids that, and that's something there. But also there's eros, and then there's also phileo, which is like a brotherly love. And that's still a very strong bond. It would be like the description of a mother to a, a son or a daughter, or a father to a son or brothers together, or even friends. Like in the Old Testament, uh, Jonathan and David, it said that they loved each other. Uh, they loved each other, and that's the kind of love that they had for each other, was a phileo love. They did, were not sexually attracted, as some people are trying to re rewrite the story today, because our culture is so sexualized, we can't imagine love outside of that concept, context anymore. But uh, there is a higher love than that, and that is the, the love that they have for each other. Of course, husband and wife experience that as well, that phileo love for each other. But then even higher than that in Greek, they have agapeo, and this is the kind of love that God says, I, want, I love you, I agapeo you, and that's the kind of love that he's giving here to Mary, and he wants us to agapeo each other. He says it very clearly later on in the New, New Testament, it's not right for a man and woman to touch each other because some people were saying, oh, we've got to love each other, and we've got to love each other in the wrong and inappropriate ways, right? And 1 Corinthians, and Paul says, no, this is a higher love. You guys are to love each other as a brother and sisters in Christ. You're to honor each other. And this is not a sexual love. This is completely outside of that, and it's a committed love. It's a choice. In fact, in, in some uh, Bibles, it's translated actually as charity because they wanted to differentiate as to just an affection for someone and a choice of making a commitment. And that's really, we've, our culture has got it all backwards. We think you, you get sexually attracted to somebody and that will produce phileo, uh, the feelings of, of affection for somebody, and then we think finally that will produce commitment. But it's not that way. It's the other way around, men and women. When we commit ourselves, we say, yes, at the married altar, I will love this person for the rest of my life, and we stay committed. Then the phileo comes, and then the, and then the true, true expression of eros love comes in marriage, and we have it all messed up. Uh, we've got it all backwards, and God says, hey, you've got to flip this around. You've got to start with this committed love, which I have for you. That's what God has, Right? He's never going to leave us. No wonder we think that God's going to leave us because we see in our relationships all around us people saying, I promise to love you, and then, for, and then a few months later or years later we say, oh, forget it. I'm not, I didn't really mean what I said at that time. God says, no, I loved you, I promise to love you, I will stand by you, and I will stay by you no matter what. And that's really what Jesus is doing here. Uh, he did not have any kind of sexual attraction for Mary. Some people, again, try to rewrite the story, saying that he had some kind of child with Mary. No, 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 no. Do not believe those things. There are, there are tons and tons of those shows on TV. If you flip on the History Channel, just because it's, it's a History Channel doesn't mean that everything is history on there. So be very, very careful. Some of it's just made up lies. And, and there's documentation to prove that it's lies. Uh, so be very careful about the lies that are being told. Jesus loved Mary in, uh, in, this, in the context of the uh, agapeo. He loved her because she was a, a child of God, and he honored her. He would have never, ever... Uh, been attracted to her in that sexual context and defiled her, really, would have been what would he would have done if, if that would have been the case, that some people are saying. So he loved her with a true and abiding love uh, that is an expression that we should all, as believers in Jesus Christ, should be uh, giving to each other. God commands us to be agapeoing each other, to be loving each other with a committed love. Even if sometimes there are some times where I don't feel like loving my brother and sister in Christ, maybe sometimes they do some things that drive us nuts, but I'm still going to stand by them because, who God stands by me. And God is real, and God is, and His love is for right now, at this time. So here we have verses 1 through 13. I want to just read those for you real quickly. But Mary stood without the sepulcher, or the tomb, uh, weeping as she wept, and she stooped down, and looking into the sepulcher, see two angels in white, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus was lain. And they said unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? And she saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. Now, now we can know absolutely positively for a fact that these were angels and not men, because no man would ever ask a woman, Why are you crying? <laughs> that was a joke, okay? <laughs> No, I hope, men, you do. When you see your wife crying, you come up to her and say, why are you crying? Is there anything I can do to help you? Uh, but uh, 
These guys were definitely angels, and they were, they were lovingly asking, hey, why are you weeping? Why are you crying? Uh, is there anything we can do to help? And, uh, men, I hope you are following that kind of an example in your marriage relationship. And, and the women, your, par- your, your mothers and your, all the women that you, you have relationships with, that you do ask them when they are weeping, what are you crying about? Is there anything that I can do to help you? Uh, sometimes, men, we tend to run away from emotion, and we need to be brave and buck up and take it and, and follow the example of Jesus Christ, who also asks later on in this passage, woman, why weepest thou? Why are you crying? Is there anything I can do to help? And yes, it may mean a few hours on the couch with a few Kleenexes, but it, could, it pays off in the, in the end, man. Don't forget that. It does. Uh, so often, often in hard times, we end up for looking for Jesus in the wrong places. And really, she's what? In a sepulcher? That's a place of the dead? And she's really kind of looking for Jesus in the wrong place, right? And so many of us, we do the same thing. Uh, we might judge Mary and say, oh yeah, Jim, Mary's, you know, here she is looking for Jesus in a sepulcher, and he's really raised from the dead. What, what, why did she know better, you know? Uh, Jesus had told them, I'm going to raise, I'm going to die three days later, I'm going to come back from the, the dead. Very clearly he'd expressed that to them. Uh, didn't she know better? Uh, well, no, she didn't know to the end of the story, right? And for us, we're in the same situation. We end up looking for some kind of historical Jesus, some Jesus that's far away, uh, some Jesus that's going to fit our picture of who he is. Uh, we have a messed up idea of who Jesus is. Boy, you can look out in pop culture today. Everybody's got an interpretation of who Jesus is and who he was and what he was about and, and uh, try to quote a few verses to support their ideas. But we need to get back into this and, and find out what this says Jesus was, what he stood for, what he, who he was. Uh, and we look for some kind of important historical fic- fic- uh, character of who Jesus is. But Jesus is not that. He's alive. He's right here, right now, present. And I think we really want to express that through the entirety of this, this message. Matthew chapter, let's turn there to verse 16, verses 21 through 23. The men, if you're at men's Bible study, this passage will sound familiar to you because we're studying through it. And I think it's relevant because Peter had a wrong idea of who Jesus was supposed to be. And let's look at that. From that time forth, Jesus began to show to his disciples how he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things, almost telling the whole story here, which is in the future at that point in Matthew chapter 16, um, suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised again on the third day. And then Peter took him and began to rebuke him. That word is basically admonished to say, hey, this is all wrong, Jesus. You're not going to die. I have a complete objection to this. This is not the way it's supposed to be. And Peter was chiding Jesus, basically like a little child, and and saying, be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. He's saying, this is no, this is no way this is going to happen. We're not even going to let this happen, right? Even Peter later on, he says, hey, you know, I would never deny you, right? And of course, he was the one that denied Jesus three times. Uh, and then verse 23, it continues, and he turned and said unto Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. Jesus like, correctly identifies exactly where that untruth comes from. Uh, and where do we get all these messed up views of Jesus? It's not from God, people. It's from Satan. It's from Satan. Satan wants to spread these kind of lies. He tells people these lies. They spread them to each other. And he says, hey, Satan has told you that. You're listening to the wrong source. Thou art an offense to me. Thou art a stumbling block, basically, to me. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those things that be of men. He said, you're listening to the wrong source. Just a few verses before this, Peter says, hey, Jesus says to Peter, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, thou art the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. And, and Jesus says, hey, that's correct. You didn't get that from men. You got that from where? You got that from heaven. You got that from God. Uh, you got that from the true and living source, uh, God and his word. And here he's listening to the wrong source. And we do the same thing. We end up listening to the wrong source, looking in the wrong place for Jesus, Listening to the wrong people interpreting Jesus. Boy, think about it today, people. I mean, who's doing a lot of work interpreting who Jesus is today? The Hollywood, right? The theater movie. And some, some things they get correct, right? There's some movies out there. Yeah, that's good. Good, that's good stuff. But be very careful. Sometimes in those good movies about Jesus are some very devastating lies about Jesus. Be very cautious. And, and the power, you know, the picture's worth a thousand words. What a movie has to say will stick with you for a long time. It's a powerful thing. Be very careful about, hey, is this a lie? Is this true? Let's go back and check in the New Testament. We have four Gospels for a reason. 
Uh, why would you have four books about the same topic? Because God wants us to know the character of Jesus Christ. He wants us to know exactly who he was from four different perspectives. And so don't be believing those lies. Be very cautious and be very careful. A lot of people think, oh, it's a movie about Jesus, so I'm a Christian. I want to go to a movie about Jesus, right? But just because it's about Jesus doesn't mean it's about the Jesus. So be very, very cautious uh, because there are lies that are devastating uh, to who we are and what we are. And when we start to believe the lies, they what? Become actions. So be very careful about looking for Jesus in the wrong places. Where do we look for Jesus? Here, in God's Word. Not, and not what other people want to say about it. So be careful about where you're looking for Jesus. And in hard times, we often look in the wrong places. It's just the way we naturally are. It's the way Mary was too. She's thinking, man, he's got to be around here someplace. And the angels are saying, hey, he's not here. Don't worry, he's gone. All right, he is, he is alive. You're looking in the wrong place. Which brings us to our next point. Finding Jesus is often as easy as turning around. I love this, the, the, the illustration here. It's not necessarily said in the text, but the illustration is very clear. And when she had said thus, speaking to the angels, right, looking into the tomb, what does she do? She turns around, looks away from the tomb. That place where she thought she'd find Jesus, she finally turns around and starts to walk away. And where does she see Jesus? Right then and there. And she turned herself back and she saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. And that's sometimes the truth. Sometimes we look around and we see Jesus sends us help, sends us that lifeboat for us to get in, that emotional lifeboat that, that can help us, change us. And again, we're still looking at the wrong sources and we don't even know what we're looking at. Uh, you know, we, we miss it because sometimes we're, we're so caught up in what we think about Jesus, our understanding of Jesus, which again, like I said, comes from the wrong sources so often. But we've got to turn around. It requires a humble repentance. I didn't mean to do this, but I stuck David Brandard in there uh, as a side note on your notes, which, by the way, you have your scripture passage on one side, and on the other side in your bulletin is all the notes. You can follow along there. Uh, the scripture reference cited will be up here on the screen, and then the other verses will be there in the John's Gospel if you want to follow along. So David Brainerd is in the notes there, and I actually am going to talk about him because David Brainerd... <clears throat> Boy, if anyone could get to heaven with a sincere uh, repentance outside of Christ, it was David Brainerd. Uh, David Brainerd wrote an extensive journal. Boy, if you read through it, you kind of get the picture. Man, David Brainerd had some emotional problems. <laughs> this poor guy, I mean, he just suffered emotionally. Uh, if you ever get a chance to read his journals, they're life-changing. A lot of people, almost everyone in history said, all the great history, missionaries in history said, I read David Brainerd's journals. It changed my life, and I wanted to go serve God because I read of what, what I read in there. But David Brainerd started off his journals as not a believer. And he would write, and he'd say, man, I would weep, and I would cry, and search for God, and I would earnestly seek for God, and I could not find Him. God seemed so far away. And finally he realized he was not going to find God in his own strength, which so many, so, much, so often we want to do. He was going to find God through repentance. When he says finally, no, God, I can't do it on my own. I am a failure. God, would you please help me? See, we often think we're going to, find, we're going to walk up to God in, in an elevated status, but God wants us to come on our knees and say, hey, God, I am broken, I'm weak, I'm, I'm a failure. Uh, can you please help this failure? And if anyone was spiritual enough to get into heaven, it was David Brainerd, man. The guy went to church every single day of the week practically. He prayed all the time. He was, from part, he was involved in the, in the highest uh, forms of church and different things outside of there in Yale University. He never, ever hung out with the, the bad crowd which in Yale University at the time. Uh, he was always a saint in every way, but then he realized, no, even, at, even he, at the best of his works, needed Jesus Christ and had to be broken before the throne of God. And finally, when he finally did that, God changed his life. He developed a relationship with Jesus Christ that changed his life, and not only, like I said, changed his life, but everyone who went there after and read David Brainerd's journals, they said, wow, this man has a relationship with God. And that relationship of God just sprang out of his life. Uh, he went to go preach to the Indians. He was offered pulpits in, England, in New England at the time, there in America, some very prestigious pulpits where he could have lived a comfortable life, uh, preaching every now and again on Sundays and doing the nice things. But he said, no, I'm not going to do that. I want to be a missionary to the Indian nations. And he said, I'm going to go and serve my life. Even though his health was poor, he would continually go back. He, he was very ill-equipped. He didn't know how to speak a lot of the Indian languages. And he had an interpreter who was often drunk. Uh, the poor interpreter was drank so much. Uh, and the, he would preach through this interpreter 
And somehow the word of God would get through that drunken interpreter and those Indians would, would break and weep and repent and come to Christ and say, we need Jesus Christ too. And hundreds of them came to Christ. The man had a huge impact. He only lived to be the age of 28 years old. But in that short life, he had a huge impact on those Indian peoples that lived in that area and bringing them to Christ. So true repentance brings a true relationship with Jesus Christ. We need that. We see that very clearly in the New Testament, Acts 2.38. Peter said unto them, repent. And that's what repentance is. It's us going the wrong way, realizing we're going the wrong way, and turning around and starting to go the right way. The, the actual route to repentance is to change directions. Turn around. right? And that's exactly what Mary did. She turned around. Uh, and we need to sometimes turn around. We're going the wrong way. We need to start going the right way. And G Peter said unto them, repent. Turn around, people, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And what? And ye shall receive the Holy Ghost. He says, hey, then Jesus is real because he's living in your heart. He's living right here, right now, and he's living within you. And that gift of the Holy Ghost is the power to live the Christian life. We can't live it without it. So, and it takes repentance first. Repentance first. Us saying, I'm wrong. I need to change. I need to be made right. Acts 3 verse 19 says, Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be what? Blotted out. Be forgiven. Completely removed. And when the time of refreshing shall come from the repentance of the Lord. And that's, he says, that's when your relationship with God will come alive. It's through your humble repentance saying, God, I need to change. I need to realize that I'm wrong. That's when your, your, this relationship will come alive. And you will have that refreshing help that you need to overcome difficult times. So, oh, we, we have the wrong verse here. The next, oh, there we go. Verse 19. Number three. Jesus wants, us there, wants to help us, but we still keep trying to do it on our own, right? We often try to do this on the wrong, in the wrong way. And here she is. She doesn't know who Jesus is. She didn't recognize him, right? And she asks him, she says, hey, we're, and Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Again, asking, concerned about her. And she, supposing him to be the gardener, said unto him, Sir, I, they have, if thou hast borne him hence, tell me where he hath thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. It's interesting, you know, I was thinking about, here's a, here's a woman, right, Mary Magdalene. I'm sure she wasn't a terribly big person. I mean, you could imagine her being able to carry off a full-grown man. It just wouldn't be possible. I don't care how strong of a woman she was, and a dead body is a really heavy thing. It usually takes several men uh, to carry a, a, a body off. And here she's thinking, I could do this on my own. I could go find the body and carry it off on my own and bring him back to where he's supposed to be. Uh, so she's still looking for a body, right? She's trying to do it in her own strength. Uh, and she's not realizing that it's only through God that we can have a change. We can't better our situation on our own. Uh, we can't change, this, change our need of salvation without Christ. Ephesians chapter 2, which is our next slide, verses 8 through 10, says it very clearly. For by grace, grace, that's something that God gives to us freely. We can't change it on our own. We can't make ourselves better on our own. And that's how we, we, again, we've always got it backwards, right? We want to come to God, we want to clean up our act and then come to God. No, God wants us to come to Him, broken, and say, God, now would you please help me clean up my act. And then we can have the grace, the power, the Holy Spirit living within us to change, uh, to overcome those uh, besetting sins, those things that keep dragging us down over and over again into, the, into an emotional darkness. For by grace, which is free, ye are saved. Not of yourselves, it is what? The gift of God. It's a gift. You can't buy it. You can't earn it. You can't try to do it on your own. Not of works, lest any man should boast, right? If we could earn it on our own, there'd be somebody out there boasting, right? I'd be like, hey, I'm so spiritual. I made it to heaven on my own strength, and you guys should all do what I do, right? You know, No, no, that's not the way God wants it to be done. He says, no. Every single one of you believers is going to have to say, no, I did it all wrong. I came to Jesus Christ, and he made it all right. And he changed everything. And I can only give glory to Jesus Christ. That's what worship is, right? Some people come to church. Why do we go to church, right? We worship God. We glorify him because he's changed our lives, right? And non-Christians have no desire to come to church, right? Because you can invite them all you want. They don't, not, God's never done anything for them. They've rejected the free gift, right? They don't have it. 
And that's the reason we come. We come because, we, wow, I'm overwhelmed with what God did for me. I was, I was living in sin. I was living in destruction. And I was going the wrong way. And God changed everything. And He made it all right. And He saved me from my sin. And we are His workmanship, right? Not our workmanship. We are His workmanship. He's the one that changes us. Created in Christ unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in Him. What does that mean? God says that God, hey, God has a plan for you. God, there are people in your life that you're going to touch. And God wants you to change and become right because He wants to use you to touch those lives. And He's already ordained them to happen, right? You know, it's funny how Peter denied Christ, but yet even before he had denied Christ, Jesus had said about him, He says, on this rock I will build my church. He says, hey, you're going to mess up, but it doesn't matter. I'm still going to create you into a whole new person that's going to be a foundation of a whole new movement called Christianity. And you're going to write the Word of God, and it's going to change lives, and it's going to spread all over the world. And people are going to know that I'm the Son of God. Jesus calls us by name. And isn't that the truth, right? I mean, if we think about, we look at, man, I was living in sin, and I decided to make this choice to follow God. But wait a minute, as I think about it more, and I look back on it more, He called my name, right? I love that. There's that one song, right? He called my name. Uh, I, did, I didn't even know, man. I was doing the wrong thing. And God said, hey, Kevin, will you listen to me? He's calling your name this morning. Will you listen to me? He's calling your name. And I love this. Uh, here she is here. Uh, verse 16, Jesus saith unto her, Mary. He doesn't have to say anything else. He doesn't have to say, Mary, this is Jesus. You're looking at him right here. Uh, he doesn't have to explain it or anything. Just her name is enough. Mary. And she instantly knows exactly who he is. How do I know that? And she turned herself and said unto him, Rabboni, which is master. She knew exactly who he was the instant he called her name. How many of you, you when God called your name, you said, no, you know what? I didn't think much about God, but when God called my name, I knew the truth. Someone was saying, talking about some of the dispute about scripture passages that are missing. And I said, hey, you guys are believers. Look at these scripture passages. Do you think they're scripture? And I said, yes, because it speaks truth to my heart. Because God has called my name. It's changed me, right? Uh, God knows us as an individual. Let's look at Isaiah 43, verse 1. Now thus hath the Lord that, God, that created thee, O Jacob, he hath formed thee, O Israel. Fear not, for I have redeemed thee. Some of us might go, oh, wait a minute, he's writing to Israel there. He's not writing to me, right? No, this is, applies directly to you. Uh, this, we're the same thing. We're, Paul says it very clear. We're grafted in to Israel. It, it applies, to, yes, directly to you as an individual. Well, this is for us. He says, I have redeemed thee. I have what? Called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. You can take that right now and apply that directly to you today and say, yes, God called my name and I am his. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. When through the rivers, though they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, they shall not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. God is saying, hey, it doesn't matter how far you go down, how low you get, I will be there every single step of the way, carrying you, being with you, helping you, giving you the strength to endure, giving you the strength to get up one more time. Please, people, if there's a verse that you write down and you memorize, memorize this verse. Write it down, Isaiah 43, 1 and 2. Because it's to you, I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. Just recently watched a message by David Gibbs who talked about his grandfather, who would always start his prayer, Lord, this is Earl. David Gibbs wondering why, why in the world would you do that? To, to, wouldn't God know your name? He asked his, his grandfather, he said, why do you always start off your prayer saying, Lord, this is Earl? And he said, I know that God knows, but I also know that he knows, I want him to know that I know that he knows, that I am his child. And we want to start every prayer with that. That changes everything, people, this morning. Uh, we're once lost, a child of wrath, and God says, hey, no, you're no longer that. You're my child, and I know you by name, right? I'm talking about this. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't even say this, but <laughs> I was watching this part of this documentary on this guy who's had all these kids with different women and stuff like that, and they asked him on the show, they said, can you name your children? 
And he couldn't. He, he went to go list, he couldn't list his children. That's kind of a sad thing, isn't it? But God, who's our Father, He says, no, I know you by name. I know each and every one of you as an individual, and I care each and every one of you as an individual. Each and every one. And Jesus cared for Mary right then, right there. I know you by name. There is no more, like I've mentioned in the past, no more powerful word in in the English language than your name. Think about it, folks. When people say your name, you turn around, right? It doesn't matter what you're doing, you know. And how many times you've been around somebody who had the same name as you, and they keep saying that other person's name, and you keep turning around looking, are they calling for me? Right? Because you know, ever since you were a little child, that name is connected with affection in every form you know it. You know, one of the most loving things is between a spouse, two spouses, right? A spouse says their name. Use someone's name. Teach them the meanings of names. Did you know that every name has a meaning? Uh, one preacher would go around preaching about that. And this one young lady came up to him, told him his name, and the name, the meaning, I don't remember what the name was, but the meaning of the name was, was the carer of pigs. And he thought, man, oh, Lord, give me something for this poor woman uh, to, to tell her that there's a meaning. And he thought, as he thought about it, the Lord said, hey, that's diligence. That's serving in the toughest places. And so he was able to express that back to her and say, hey, you're the type of person that God could use you to serve in the toughest, hardest places. You're diligent, you work hard, and you're willing to serve people that maybe nobody else will care about. And that changed that woman's life. She said, hey, I'm not just a, di- a carer of pigs. I'm God's holy servant. You know, use, pe- use people's names, learn their meanings. Most, trust me, <laughs> don't be scared of using people's names here because of that story. If you look at most people's names, there is wonderful godly meanings to most names. I remember my mother would remind me as a growing up, she said, Kevin means gentleman. Are you going to be a gentleman? Are you going to live up to that? And she would teach me things about how to be a gentleman and things like that. So use the power of someone's name. And Jesus did. Again, what did he say? He didn't say anything else. He just used her name. He just said, Mary, I know who you are. I know where you are at. I know you're crying. I know you're broken. I know everything's all gone wrong for you. But I'm right here, right now, for you here today. It takes true surrender to realize who the master is, right? And she says, boy, she she holds nothing back here. She actually says, she says, Rabboni. Now, in in the Hebrew context there, a rabbi was a a master, a teacher. And that's what master means as well. It's more of a teacher. It's someone, a respected teacher. To call someone that, you say, that's a respected teacher of God's word. But she doesn't just use the word rabbi. She uses the word Rabboni, which is an even stronger term, that you are my teacher. You're specifically my teacher. You're the teacher that I look to. You're the, the teacher of all teachers, basically, is what she's calling him there when she says the word Rabboni. She says, you are my Lord and my master. You're my God. And she says that very clearly. She says, I want you to be the one that reigns over me. I want you to be the king of the Jews, right? Not just the king of the Jews in general, but the king of this Jew. And that's where we come, if we don't come as believers and say, no, I need a king, me personally. You know, that's, why, why do people, you know, someone was doing that, <laughs> anyway, I'm not going to name any individuals, but there was a show going around why, the, about the Messiah complex that humans have. Let's face it, every human in history, we're looking for some kind of leader that's going to lead us into utopia. And boy, we've got, humans have gotten into big trouble following all different kinds of Adolf Hitlers and all these different people. Uh, because people can't do that. No human can be your Messiah. It takes someone who's God Almighty to be your Messiah. And that's who Jesus was. I mean, even common sense. I was reading through that just recently. Thomas Paine's book. He says, hey, you guys, you got it all messed up. This is common sense. Every single one of you know this. It's straight out of the Bible. Look back there in Samuel where it says, hey, God, they asked for a king. And God says, okay, you want a king? I'll give you a king. <laughs> And you'll, you'll regret it day tomorrow morning when you wake up and you go, man, I don't like this king anymore. He's no good. And he's going to tax you and he's going to take your sons and daughters and he's going to do everything to you. He says, you're looking for a Messiah in the wrong place. And he says, and Thomas Paine says, hey, that's where we get that whole concept. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. Uh, I trust you. You put any man in that position and it will corrupt him. I don't care how good of a man he is where he has absolute divine right of kings and things like that, and he can do whatever he wants, and his word is what goes and goes, 
No, that's no human can hold that position because we all have a sin nature and we all will be corrupted by it. But Jesus can hold that position because what? He's God Almighty. He's above all of that. It says it very clearly in Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 5. Behold, the days shall come, saith the Lord, and I will raise up unto David a righteous uh, branch, and a king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and justice in the earth. Now, we don't have Christ reigning physically. He will reign eventually physically in, the, in a new kingdom, right? A thousand-year reign of Christ, and then he's going to reign forever after that. But he should be reigning in people's hearts, right? Each and every one of us we just talked about. This is all about an individual here. Uh, this is all about you and God. And boy, we can see that when believers are submitting themselves to the King Jesus, it changes everything. It changes the world around you. Uh, you know, back in, in, in um, I was sharing this with somebody else, William Wilberforce. In his, time, his day and age, slavery was legal. Uh, there was all kinds of different abuses that went on for all different kinds of people, but God got a hold of one man's heart, and he started changing his whole nation around him. He said, no, hey, we've got to change this slavery thing. We've got to make it laws against it. He passed the first laws, and only that, he also changed a lot of the way people treated animals. As you know that, he was the first one to start a humane society. He said, hey, you can't go out there and beat your horse all day long. God does not want that. You need to take care for the weaker things, not destroy them and take advantage of them. We want to care for weaker people, weaker animals, whatever they are. It's wrong to, just because someone has a different color of skin, we get wrong to put them in slavery. Uh, We've got to stand up and do what's right no matter what. Uh, because these are people and God loves them. And uh, he changed his culture in his day and time because he believed and he took God at his word and he said, I want to have a King Jesus. I'm not going to listen to what culturally or even legally is telling me what is right and wrong because at that time it was legal to own another human being. And a lot of people said, well, because it's legal, it must be right, right? You know, I'm still saying that today, right? No, and he said, no, that we look in the Bible, every human being is a treasure to God. It doesn't matter what color they are, who they are. God loves them, and they deserve a right to have, pursue happiness and do the right thing and serve God and honor Him. We want King Jesus. Verse 6 says, In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell in safety, and, he shall, and his name shall, whereby we, he shall be called the Lord our Righteous. Now, what does that say in Hebrew? Remember what I was saying about only Jesus Christ, who is God, can hold that position of kingship? This is very clearly talking about the Messiah here, Jesus Christ, that's going to come. What is, what is that saying in Hebrew? The Lord our righteous? It says it is Jehovah Sitkanu. So when a certain denomination comes and knocks on your door and says Jesus wasn't Jehovah, it says it right here in the Bible that Jesus is God. He's not just God, he's Jehovah God from the Old Testament, the God of the Old Testament, the I am that I am, all that John has been saying throughout this gospel, he's God, and that's why he can be king. He's not just a regular human or some kind of lowly God or some kind of angel, he's God Almighty. And if we recognize him as so, it will change our lives. Number six is don't touch me. You might be like, what? What in the world? What are we talking about here? Well, let's look at verse 17. A, and Jesus said unto her, Touch me not, for I am not ascended. Now in English, that comes across a little bit harsh. Harsh. Excuse me. It sounds like, what is, what is Jesus doing? He's saying, oh, don't even touch me. You don't, even, don't even come anywhere close. But the reality in the Greek, it's more, stop touching me. Or don't continue to cling to me, actually, really, is what she's doing here. She recognizes who he is. She's just called him Rabboni and Master. And she's gotten down on her hands and knees and she's actually clinging to his feet, holding on with everything she's got. And what Jesus is really saying here, he's not saying, don't touch me because I don't want you to touch me, or, or stay away from me, woman, you got germs. He's saying, hey, you don't need to cling on because I'm always going to be with you. I'm always going to be with you in spirit. It doesn't matter if my physical body is not here, I'm going to be with you in your heart. And it's, I'm always going to be with you. You don't need to keep clinging on. I'm here with you right now, and I'm never going to leave you from this point on. That's really, I think, what he's expressing to her. You don't have to keep clinging to, to the actual body of Jesus Christ. And again, this goes back to what our misunderstandings of Christ. We want to go to a location where we experience God. We want to look for God, some kind of physical object that we can attach to God. And that's idolism, right? I mean, look back in history. That's a, I'm going to make a little idol, and that's going to be God. I'm going to worship, and I can go to it and touch it. No, Jesus is saying, I don't care where you are 
how far you go, I'm right there with you right in that moment because I'm spirit, right? It says it back in the beginning of John. He says, I'm not, I'm not a place or a, or, or a building or a, 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 a church or anything like that. I'm, I'm a spirit, and I can be anywhere at any time and be with you no matter what. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5 says, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For I saith, he will never leave thee nor forsake thee. What does that produce? What kind of action should that produce into us? It's so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Praise God. Amen. Amen. It doesn't matter what man does to me. I know I've got Jesus by my side. No matter what, that he's going to be with me. For, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 14, Paul says it very clearly. He says, hey, if Christ is not risen from the dead, if he's not living with us, dwelling with us right here, right now, uh, then it's all useless. You might as well stay home and watch football because church is, is useless. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 14, and if Christ be not risen, then our preaching is in vain. You might as well not even listen to a preacher. And your faith is also in vain. He says, you take this doctrine out, there is no Christianity. It's all worthless. If, if the dead rise not, there is not is, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised not, then your faith is in vain. It's worthless. And you are still in your sins. And if they which are fallen asleep or in Christ are, are perished, if, if this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all most men most miserable. And what is this? Well, this is the resurrection of Jesus Christ, right? This changes everything. Before he was a man, you had to go to Palestine to go see Jesus Christ. But now, as a risen Savior, He's everywhere. We could be in Stony Ford, and God is here. Jesus Christ is here with us. And Paul's saying, hey, we got to get back to this preaching that Jesus Christ has come back to life. And we got to preach that and preach that alone, because that's, that's truly what gives us faith. That's truly what gives us life. That's truly what makes this church thing all worth it, and all worth, <laughs> sitting there for two hours, all worth it, and, and wonderful, in fact. Because he's, say, he's come back to life and he lives with us and we get a chance to worship him. Finally, we have verse 17b here. Uh, the next part is verse 17. A command to share. Jesus doesn't just say, hey, I'm never going to leave you, but I want you to go tell other people about what you've experienced here. Because we, I hope you've experienced something. Like I said, I started off this morning. I hope something, you, something touches you this morning. Because it's absolutely vital. You're going to go, if nothing touches you this morning, you're going to go back into the community with that big old frown that you came in with, all right, on. And you're going to share that with all the unchristians out there. And they're going to wonder, man, those are a bunch of hypocrites that go to that church, right? But if we come in here and we get touched and we go out with that smile and say, hey, I know Jesus Christ personally, not because he's in the Bible, but because he's in my heart and he's changed my life. And boy, that's infectious. You can't stop that kind of evangelism. Trust me, there's, there's all different kinds of forms of evangelism, but that's the one that really works. Is when we go back out in the community and we say, hey, God's changed my life. Uh, can I tell you about it? And a lot of times we want to go and pound on people's doors and force them to sit down and listen, but work on earning the right to give them, to share. Right? So many of us Christians, we don't do that. We don't earn that right to say, hey, can I tell you about my God who's changed my life? They're not interested in a God who's changed your life if it hasn't changed your life. Right? They're like, hey, you can keep that one. Right? I'm not interested in him. He hasn't changed you. How is he going to change me? Right? Who's even a worse, who they might think is even a worse of a sinner. Right? But if he's changed your life, then you can say, hey, God's touched my heart, and I want to tell you a little bit about it. And they will sit, and they will listen. You know, uh, George Whitfield, I've talked about him in the past. People would come for miles and miles around to hear this guy preach. He would prepare his sermons on his knees. Now, I don't do that, I have to admit. My knees would wear out too, way too fast. And he would spend hours with his Bible and his Matthew Henry commentary preparing. As these, he says, if God will set me on fire, men will come to watch me burn. Uh, because they, they will be under... It's very likely the crowds that he did in, you do, start to do the math, he probably preached to everyone in the United States at that time, probably missing hardly anyone. And thousands of people became Christians. It's actually referred to as one of the first great awakening uh, started by him. Uh, because he had this passion to share the truth and to preach God's word. Now, a lot of times we think, oh, well, back then people were just kind of good anyways. No, they said of, of 
the colonies at that time, it was an extremely sinful time. There were more, uh, <laughs> there were literally, at the time of the revolution, there were more brothels and prostitute houses in, in New York City than there are ever have been in 200 years. Uh, it was legal at that time. And, and George Washington, with his army, he had all kinds of trouble with his men deserting and running off to, to go get into trouble. In New York City, when they were stationed close to there, he said, hey, we've got to get these guys back, and we've we got a war to fight here, and they're all falling into sin. Sin was rampant at that time. Alcohol was, was run rampant. People were drunk all the time. People were broken down. And when George Whitfield came and started preaching the gospel, people, they had hard hearts. But God had that man on fire, and he preached like no other man did before. He actually had crossed eyes, and he spoke with somewhat of a lisp, so he wasn't the person that you would naturally think would be a good person. In fact, there was one instance where uh, a man, had, they were mocking George Whitfield and mo mocking his message. And so they, there was a bar, and the, all the guys were sitting there drinking in the bar, mocking George Whitfield and saying, hey, we're never going to convert to this Christianity. We're not going give to up, give up our sinful lifestyle. We're just going to do what we want to do. So one of the guys stood up and said, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make fun of George Whitfield tonight for you guys. He said, I've heard so many sermons from George Whitfield, I can copy him exactly. So one of the guys stood up in the bar and started preaching like George Whitfield did, and he kind of mocked the lisp, and he, he crossed his eyes, and he went through almost an entirety of, of George Whitfield's sermons. And you know what happened in that bar that night? People started getting saved. And by the time he was done with that sermon, every single person in that, that, that bar was on their knees saying, God, I need to change. I'm, I'm going the wrong way, and I need to repent, and I need Jesus in my heart. You know, that, that, that's humbling to us preachers because God can even use a guy, a drunk guy in a bar to sometimes preach the gospel, right? Uh, he can use anyone he wants to, but we need to share the gospel because it's commanded to us. She's told, we're also told, Mark chapter 16, verse 15, it says unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, every single individual. It doesn't matter who they are, go and preach the gospel. They deserve it. They need to hear Go and share it. Share it with our lives. Francis of Assisi said, I will preach the gospel always, and I will use words if necessary. What did he mean by that? He said, hey, I'm going to preach gospel with my lifestyle. And then if somebody comes along and asks about that, I'm going to say, hey, this is how I got changed. So, and second, third, eight, number eight it says, our God is personal. If we haven't been getting that from this message, I haven't been preaching it right, because this is all about Jesus Christ is personal. He's there. He cares about Mary. He cares about her as an individual. Uh, he wants to be there for her, be there with her. And our God is personal. Jesus underscores that again. He says, I have sent not ascended to my Father. I'm going to ascend, basically. He's going to be making that prediction. He says, not to my Father, he doesn't say. He says, to your Father, to my Father, and to your Father, and to my God, and to your God. He says, hey, this is not just an event that's going to happen, but this is, you are directly tied. You are directly uh, personal. Remember what Paul said back there? Hey, if without the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you might as well stay home, people, and watch TV, because it's just worthless, right? He's saying, hey, without that resurrection, this is, you, this is worthless. And Jesus is saying, hey, because I've risen again, this can be your God, your Father, He's our personal God. John chapter 14, verse 23 says, And Jesus answered and said to him, If any man love me, and keep, will keep my words, and my Father will, what? Love him, agapeo him, and he will come into him, and we will make our abode with him. You know, who, do the, who, do, who are the people you want to live with, right? Do you want to live with someone you can't stand? No, right? I mean, that's, people get divorced, right? They can't stand their spouse anymore, right? You want to live with somebody who you like, right? And Jesus is saying, hey, I will come and live with you. We will abide together. Not some historical Jesus who was in the past, who lived and died, but who lives within me right here, right now. And loves me right here, right now. Final thought here is, where are you going to obey? We've got to tell people about our personal experience of, with God, and we've got to tell people about what He has spoken to me personally, and that is through His Word. Use your testimony, people. If that's what you want, if you, to share the gospel, use your testimony. I've shared this before. I'm going to share it again. My father was a devout atheist. He did not believe in God in any way, shape, or form. He rejected God entirely. His father had very much instilled that in him. He was actually reading a magazine on evolution and why that, that is the foundation for an atheist belief. And another believer, he was in, in, had in service there during, during the, uh, right after the Vietnam War, another believer who was in the camp there came up to him and said, hey, can I tell you my testimony? 
That's all he asked. He didn't say, hey, I want to tell you about Jesus or I want to talk to you about all this. Can I tell you what happened to me personally? My father sat and he listened and he got saved because that man shared his testimony. I probably wouldn't be here today if that man had not had the bravery to walk over and say, hey, can I share my testimony with you? Share your testimony, people. Don't talk about, well, let's uh, look at Jesus from all this historical perspective and say, you know what, Jesus has changed my life. Can I tell you about it? Can I tell you about my personal experience? You know, I will, it doesn't matter who they are. Almost anyone will listen to that. You know, they might say, oh, well, that's fine for you, and I don't want to have anything to do with it. But almost everyone will listen to your personal experience and say, hey, I'd like to think about that. Share your testimony. I remember uh, in Russia, we get called on to preach at short notice. In fact, sometimes the preacher would just end a sermon. He'd say, okay, now Kevin, Kevin Weston's going to preach this morning. And I remember being like, well, I am. <laughs> uh, so there were a couple times I got caught off guard. And I remember once, uh, many times I'd go up there and I didn't have anything else to share. I hadn't really studied or anything. But I knew my testimony. I knew how God saved me. And so I shared my testimony. And that meant more to those people. I remember they just, they would process that and they go, man, oh, that, God's changed this guy. He was living for himself and God's turned him around. Share your testimony. It's something you always have with you. you don't, you're not going to forget your personal experience, right? No, well, may, maybe someday, right? But uh, for most of us, at least we can remember most of our personal experience, share your testimony. Say, God's changed my heart. God's changed my life. I had a personal experience with Jesus Christ. He's changed my life. Share that with people. Share your testimony. Uh, um, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 7, it says, and, I lay, and he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched my lips. That's a personal experience with God. And thy iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. And I hear the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Well, if God's asking that, there must not be a whole lot of guys to send, is there? And I mean, God knows everybody in the world. If God's saying, Hmm, who are we going to send? There's, a lot of, there's not a lot of Nehemiah standing in the gap. There's not a lot of people being obedient to God. They're all being Jonah's, right? Running away from what God wants them to do. And then he said, Isaiah said, Then said I, here am I, send me. And he said, go and tell this people. Go and tell them what? Go and tell them what you just experienced. Go and tell them how you saw God come and change your life and take away the sin and make you a whole new person. He said, go and preach that. And of course, the rest of that passage is God saying, they're not going to listen. (laughs) <laughs> which is going to happen sometimes, people. They're not going to listen because of the hardness of their heart. But some people will, and they'll change their life because of you're willing to share. Talk about your personal experience. If you don't have a personal experience, get one. Get one. You're look, again, let's go back to the beginning of the sermon, start this whole thing all over again. You're looking for Jesus in the wrong place if you've not had any personal experience with Jesus Christ. And all those moments where I sat and prayed and God came and we met and we prayed, I prayed together. Those experiences have been uh, high points, pinnacles of my life. I have steered my life off those moments. But really, every single day should be an experience with Jesus Christ. And it can be what? Through this. God's Word. Again, we're looking for Jesus in the wrong places. We're looking for some kind of mystical Jesus that's going to come out of some kind of cloud and, and tell us, enlighten us. Uh, But no, he says, I've written my word. How many pages are in your Bible? Go look at the end of the Bible. Look how many pages of God's word he's written to you, expressing his love to you, saying, hey, would you please come back to me over and over and over again? And and we ignore that. Don't think God's going to come and give you some special word from him. Will you ignore this? I hear that sometimes in churches. Some people, they never ever crack a Bible, but then they come and, oh, I got a word from the Lord. Well, I don't think so. You might be getting a word from somebody else who does speak, and he's called Satan, right? And he's all too happy to people to speak to believers who are not in their Bibles listening to the truth of God's Word. Speak that. Maybe you might say, well, I, I don't know. I, I think back in my life, I don't know if I've, God's ever spoke to me. Probably hasn't really in audible form. Most of us so rarely get that, right? But he has through his Word. He spoke to you, and this is to you and each and every one of you here today. Use God's Word, uh, because it's a treasure written to you. I love Psalm 119. If, if, if you struggle with valuing God's Word, if you struggle with getting in God's Word, go read Psalm 119, because it says it over and over and over and over and over and again. And finally, maybe some of us get the point of it, right? Uh, but uh, the, ver- the chapter's already started. It goes on to, oh man, how many verses are in Psalms? 
150 some odd verses in Psalms 119. But this is verse 9 and continuing, uh, which is actually the next letter B, Beth, in the alphabet of the Hebrew alphabet. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his, his way? How do we change the sin that's in our life? He says, uh, David says it very clearly, by taking heed thereunto according to thy word. By looking and searching in Scripture passages, with my whole heart I have sought thee. Let me not wander from thy commandments. God's word again. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Blessed art thou, O Lord, that teach me thy statutes, thy word. You know, you get, you get reading through this, you realize how many ways different God refers to his word. Statutes, commandments, words. Same thing. He's all talking about the same thing. He's not changing the subject here. And with my lips I will declare the judgments of thy mouth. Again, there's another way to refer to God's word. God's mouth, right? I rejoice in the way of thy testimonies. There's another way to refer to God's word. It's his God's testimonies. As much as is all history. Why, why does someone like history? Because it's what? It's his story. God's story, right? His testimony. That's what history is. And I will meditate in thy precepts, and I have respect unto all thy ways, God's word. And I will delight thyself in thy statutes, God's word. And I will not forget thy word. Get back in the word. We're looking for Jesus in the wrong places. We're out of time. We've got to close this up. Let's go ahead and bow for prayer. With every eye closed, every head bowed. This is not a time for looking around and thinking about, hmm, is, I wish someone so was here to hear, was here to hear this message. Or, man, I hope somebody, I hope that person was listening to this message this morning. They needed it. No, this is you and God. And it was no mistake that Mary, that Jesus picked Mary Magdalene to come to. He wanted to show her his love. You know, you remember, where did Mary Magdalene come from? She had seven devils in her heart. She knew what blackness was. She knew what darkness was. She knew what sin was. And Jesus says, I want to come to you and change everything. Make it all good again. With every eye closed, every head bowed. I just, I just pray to God that you would take a moment now and say, Jesus, I need that Jesus. If you are praying that this morning, if you're saying, God, I'm a sinner, I need to be cleansed, which should be all of us, even us believers, if you're praying that this morning, you're having a personal experience with Jesus Christ because He's going to do that. Don't pray something unless you want it to come true. <laughs> Some of us pray things and, we don't, and then we wish they're not going to happen. And then we wonder why things don't turn out the way <laughs> we don't wonder about faith. God wants to answer your prayers. And He will answer your prayers this morning. Tell God, I need Jesus to change my life. I need Him to to make me whole. I need Him for salvation. I need Him for everlasting life, which starts right here today and then continues into eternity. Dear God, I just pray, Lord, that this morning that we would come in humble repentance, that we'd stop looking for Jesus in all the wrong places, but come back to the truth of God's Word and say, I need the Jesus right here who's with me today. Like Paul said, that's what makes it all worthwhile, his resurrection, his life that he gives to me. Lord, I just pray, God, that we would be seeking that everlasting fountain of truth, the living water, which changes it all. I pray that you bless these people this morning. Bless them as they seek you. Renew their walk. Express your love to them, Lord, the hurting, the dying, the suffering. God, you hate to see us suffer, but so often we just stay right in it and then wonder where you are. When you say, you're, you're freely offering your hand to say, come, just take my hand. I will take you out of that. I will give you a new heart which sees the world in a whole new perspective. I will change everything, not everything around you, but everything within you and make it all new again. Lord, we just have to reach up and take the hand. But I just pray, God, this morning that people would be willing to do that. I pray these things in your name. Amen.